Welcome to St. Matthew's. We are celebrating Ash Wednesday tonight, and uh, I want to just comment for a little bit on two things. First is we're celebrating also communion, and uh, we're going to be using continuous communion tonight. Uh, so we'll be ushering a side out at a time. However, we're also going to be doing the imposition of ashes for all of you that would like to have that, you know, as a reminder of our Lenten journey and a, a state of really penitence, you know, as we repent and turn back to Christ. Um, so we're going to, for that, dismiss both sides. We'd like you both, both aisles to come out, and we'll have four of us, two on each side here, so you'll simply come down the front and exit around the, you know, the side aisles. And obviously just go, if you're the first one, go to the farthest person, and then the next one will, will go to me, and then vice versa over here. And Pastor Sam Waters is going to help out along with two of our elders. And that will occur right after uh, we finish confession and absolution. I'll announce it. So is that fairly clear? So for imposition, we're doing both sides. For communion, we're doing one side at a time. And as we celebrate communion tonight... Um, all of you are welcome, but know that if you're not a member of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod that we celebrate what's called closed communion. So we ask that you really be a member of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod, but please come up for a blessing. But to receive communion, we'd like you to be a member because we actually are communing around the, the corporate body of beliefs uh, called our Lutheran Confessions, which ascribe to Scripture. And also we commune you know, with the body and blood of Christ in, with, and under the bread and wine. So... Um, uh, love to have you up here and you receive a blessing if you don't take communion. Please prepare your hearts and minds for worship on this Ash Wednesday as we open with the opening hymn.
We begin this Ask Wednesday service in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Today we begin our Lenten journey, recognizing the witnesses who point to Christ. John the Baptist directs us to Jesus, proclaiming, Please kneel as you're able to. Please take a moment for personal and private confession. John's words remind us that we all need forgiveness. We cannot escape our sin, guilt, or shame on our own. Though we may be able to try to hide our sin, our Heavenly Father knows all things. He invites us to turn to Him so that our sin, guilt, and shame might be taken away. Together we confess. Lord, we come before you filled with regrets, things we should not have done. Words we wish we could take back, and thoughts we cannot bear to remember. Our sins have infected our relationships with others, and our relationship with you, Lord. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so the joy of your salvation might be restored to us. John's words tonight remind us that forgiveness comes to us from Jesus. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world by his death and resurrection. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I announce you the forgiveness of sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please rise as you're able to. We are indeed forgiven tonight in Christ. Still, in this world we suffer the wages of sin, which is death. We endure pain, disease, and grief. Today we receive the mark of the cross upon us in the form of ashes. These ashes remind us that we are merely dust and ashes, and that when we die, our bodies will return to dust and ashes. But the sign of the cross also reminds us that dust and ashes are not the end for us. When Jesus returns, he will, of course, raise us from the dead, and we will live forever with him in the new creation. Please be seated, and we'll dismiss from the back on both sides of the aisles. And uh, we'll have the two elders, if you would come up.
Lord have mercy. Lord have mercy. The peace of the Lord be with you. Please rise. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, you sent your Son to be the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Embolden us tonight to follow him on the journey to the cross. Learning as we go from those witnesses who point us to Jesus, our forgiveness and our life. Through the same Jesus Christ, your Son and our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. The Old Testament reading for this Ash Wednesday is from Joel, chapter 2. Yet even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning, and rend your hearts and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and he relents over disaster. Who knows whether he will not turn and relent, and leave a blessing behind him, a grain offering and a drink offering for the Lord your God. Blow the trumpet in Zion, consecrate a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the people, consecrate the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children, even nursing infants. Let the bridegroom leave his room and the bride her chamber. Between the vestibule and the altar, let the priest, the minister of the Lord, weep and say, Spare your people, O Lord. And make not your heritage a reproach, a byword among the nations. Why should they say among the peoples, where is their God? Then the Lord became jealous for his land and had pity on his people. The Lord answered and said to his people, Behold, I am sending to you grain, wine, and oil, and you will be satisfied. And I will no more make you a reproach among the nations. This is the word of the Lord. Our epistle reading is from 2 Corinthians chapters 5 and 6. The Apostle Paul says, We implore you on behalf of Christ to be reconciled to God. For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Working together with him then, we appeal to you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For he says, in a favorable time I listened to you, and in a day of salvation I have helped you. Behold, now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. We put no obstacle in anyone's way, 
so that no fault may be found with our ministry. But as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way. By great endurance in afflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labors, sleepless nights, hunger, by purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, the Holy Spirit, genuine love, by truthful speech and the power of God, with weapons of righteousness for the right hand and for the left, through honor and dishonor, through slander and praise. We are treated as impostors and yet are true, as unknown and yet well-known, as dying and behold, we live, as punished and yet not killed, as sorrowful and yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing yet possessing everything. This is the word of the Lord. And I'm going to. You can say, you can rise, please, but I'm going to read the gradual here first. You're fine. O come, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the sixth chapter. Jesus said, Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people, in order to be seen by them, for then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. Truly, I say to you, that they receive their reward. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray... You must not be like hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues at the street corners that they may be seen by others. But truly I say to you that they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room, shut the door, and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees you in secret will reward you. And when you fast, don't look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces. And their fasting may be seen by others. Truly I say to you that they have received their reward. But when you fast... Anoint your head and wash your face, that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret. And as your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also." That is the gospel of the Lord, but I have a second reading. This is from St. John, the first chapter. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks before me, because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but for this purpose I came baptizing with water, that he might be revealed to all of Israel. And John bore witness. I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. And I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and I have borne witness that this is the Son of God. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Please join me now in the words of the Nicene Creed as our confession of faith. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven, and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father, 
and he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins. And I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. we got a double dose of the gospel tonight. A little bit from the lectionary and then from your bulletin. But the gospel we're really going to be following during this series is the gospel of John. Now, I don't know if any of you have tattoos. Probably some of you I know do. Uh, and there's really nothing wrong with that. And we really received the mark of the ashes on our head today, but that's not permanent. Yet... For those that have had tattoos, when we look at some of the statistics, the removal of tattoos is really burgeoning. I think there is about 30% of Americans, regardless of age, are reported by a survey done in 2019 by a group called Ipsos that they all wear a, at least one tattoo. But there is a growing industry of tattoo removal for those that possibly regret putting on maybe one or more tattoos in whatever location 
they may be on your person. According to Allied Market Research in 2020, the global tattoo market, knowing you wanted to know this, is 478 million in 2019, projected to reach 795 million by 2027 for tattoo removal. So it's rather amazing, isn't it? Now, Pete Davidson, uh, he took this picture for uh, GQ, and he has over 100 tattoos on his body. If you don't know the individual, uh, he's a comedian that first got exposed on Saturday Night Live, and then he went on to actually get into theater and into movies, I should say, so he became an actor. But while he was going through acting, he found out that he had to spend up to three hours at a time to cover up all his tattoos for certain movies because it wasn't considered kosher for some of them to be representing all those tattoos. So he said that, uh, I honestly never thought I'd get the opportunity to act, but I love it a lot. You get there three hours early to cover your tattoos because for some reason people in the movies, they just don't like them that much. So he started on a process of tattoo removal. And by, when you do tattoo removal, it can take up to 12 sessions to remove a single tattoo, depending, of course, the size and the depth of ink that's used and the color of ink. So anyway, his goal is he's 28 years old right now, and he set a goal by age 30, he's going to be tattoo-free. So good for Mr. Davidson. And he's sitting there sort of going through his tattoo removal process. And as we sort of think like tattoos, sometimes you may have regrets. And I do want to say, tattoos, there's nothing wrong with a tattoo. For if some of you have them and keep them, you know, God bless you, nothing at all wrong with them. I was just looking at where some of the industry trends are occurring. And sometimes tattoos, like with Pete Davidson, after he had them on, he started at age 17, putting them on his body. And he had girlfriends that he, he recorded, and he had his dad passed away, he had that, and he had a lot of sayings. And he just ended up having a bit of regret. And it's almost, and we're in this Lenten season, it's very easy to look at our past lives and sort of have some regrets. Maybe it's the pictures that we wish we'd, when we're looking in the mirror, the pictures we'd wish we'd see. <laughs> um, maybe it's the face of someone that we hurt. Maybe it's the amount of money that, like me, I wasted, or you wasted. Maybe it's all the couldas and shouldas that we sort of add up over our time on this earth. I could have been a better dad. I could have been a better mother. I could have been a better son. I could have been a better daughter. I could have been a better grandparent. I could have been a better single person. I could have been a lot better. I could have paid closer attention. I could have been a better student. I could have and should have. Dig around in the basement of your life and think on what, if you could have, you might want to have changed. Maybe it was wasted years. Maybe it was obsessive greed. Maybe it was destructive diversions that happened to be a part of your past. Maybe it was anger. Maybe it was arrogance, possibly selfishness. Maybe racial slurs. And what can we do with all these unwanted marks all over our body and inside us? Mainly, they're kept inside our mind. Well, one is we can get defensive very easily. We can say, well, we're not going to admit to anything. We're not going to really tell anyone. We're going to keep that skeleton sort of locked up in the closet where it belongs. And that is one strategy. Another is that we, we sort of see these marks of regret and, and they, they begin to consume us and we feel defeated. And that can be a real problem and probably the greater problem today because I think many of us are quite open with our past to many of those that we know, and that's a good thing. But it can go to the other extreme where we feel really self-flagellating. We get we're a little hard on ourselves. Defensive people hide their marks. Defeated people replay their marks. Both are bad, but the replay is really destructive. So as we begin Lent this year, I would like you to think, that this is a time, as the prophet Joel said in our Old Testament reading, that we want to sort of regroup and have each of us be brought back to Christ. It's a chance really for us to draw closer to Christ. And we're going to start out with a series of witnesses during these Lenten presentations. 
all following the Gospel of John. And it's a beautiful portrayal of all of them really leading us back to Christ, as Joel calls us to do, with your whole heart, not part. To get rid of those defensive marks we hide and to get rid of those replay marks that keep going back and back and get replayed in our minds. John the Baptist is the one we're going to start with. And you look at this woolly monster there wearing camel hair, eating honey and locust, and he could be a little bit of a scary person if you saw him right now today. But he brought a unique message. The Gospel writer, the Gospel of John, presents John the Baptist as a man on a mission. He says that there was a man sent from God whose name was John. John, the Gospel writer, talks about John the Baptist. He came as a witness, John says, to bear witness about the light, that all might believe through him. That's John 1, verses 6 to 7. John the Baptist's mission was to bear witness about the light because, as you know, he was not the light. He was not worthy, he said, to even unlace Christ's sandal. In fact, 14 times in John's Gospel, the word witness is connected with John the Baptist. 14 times. He was not the light, but he came bear, to bear witness about the light, the true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming in to the world. John isn't the message. John is the messenger. He is the one bringing it back to us and bringing us to us tonight. He said the following words. I'm not the light. I'm not the Christ, John 1.20. I'm not Elijah or a prophet, John 1.21. I'm not worthy to untie his sandals, John 1.27. No wonder John the Baptist says these beautiful words, he must increase, I must decrease. That was John the Baptist as witness. What does he say then about being defensive about our sins, sort of keeping the skeleton in the closet? He says, behold, the Lamb of God, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. Behold the Lamb, that beautiful Lamb, that Passover Lamb that ties us back to the Old Testament. That Passover Lamb who is Christ, who shed His blood, not to have blood placed on the lintel to save the people, the children of Israel, but the blood that He bore on the cross, on that other piece of wood to save all of us and all of mankind. When it comes to all of our ugly marks of sin, we know that whether they're hidden or whether they're replaying in our minds, they are erased with the blood of Christ, washed clean, gone forever. Not even in a moment of time does God reconsider sins that you may have committed or that you're replaying or that you're hiding in His mind. They are gone. It is a clean slate. No more do they exist. So no need to hide them in the closet. No need to replay them because they're gone. In both John 129 and 136, John the Baptist says, Behold the Lamb of God. This isn't the ordinary Lamb of God. This is the Passover Lamb, as we have on that slide. John uses the word Passover 11 times in his gospel. The whole gospel is structured to have us behold Take note, take a look at, this is the Passover Lamb of God come to save us. Behold the Lamb who takes away. The verb takes away, the Greek word is used in what is considered the present tense, meaning it didn't happen in the past, it's happening right now. He still takes away sins that you happen to commit, that you might be replaying right now because they just happened yesterday or a moment ago. Every single sin he takes away. And it includes our ugly stuff, our shameful sin, our haunting sin. You know, the stuff that just nags at you, he takes it away. And Christ not only takes away our sin, he removes the guilt. And maybe what's even worse today is the sense of shame that we can feel. Shame because we know better and we didn't act. Shame is what we feel when someone often wrongs us. Now, we all know what public shame feels like. That's, you know, branded by, say, a divorce. 
marked by a handicap where it's visible to everyone, saddled with alcoholic parents or with a even personal history of alcoholism, crushed because of a child's arrest, or we feel stigmatized because we lost our job and nobody's going to think we're worthy to be around in this social construct, or we lost our spouse and we feel like we're just not the same, our identity has changed because we lost part of our own flesh. And maybe we lost our home, maybe we lost our savings, and now everyone knows that we're not the same. But then, there's private shame, and we've all felt that. Maybe you've been punished to the edge by an abusive spouse, maybe molested by a perverted parent, hopefully not, but it's out there in this broken world. And no one else may know these things, but we know, and that's enough to bury us deep in shame. And when we put our hands over our ears and we splash water onto our face, you know, we just can't get rid of it. We may go for a long drive in the car, but that sense of shame, those replays, those hidden skeletons tend to come back. And then we realize that the Lamb of God has taken it away. Sin tried to mark us with its tattoo, permanent, on our forehead and on our heart and inside our brains. But that's not the end of the story, of course. We don't have to work away our sin, drink away our sin, explain away our sin, eat away our sin, cry away our sin, or bury away our sin. God got rid of it all. And God does more than just imagine it. John the Baptist says again, Behold! And when he says behold, he says, See! Gaze at this lamb. Take a hard look at him. And the person that's going to be behind that lamb hanging on the cross, the real Son of God in the flesh, what Jesus did. Tell others what Jesus said, what you saw, how what you took, and how you now feel as a Christian. Tell others. You have a clean slate. Confession, when we have that, and we're calling for that during Lent, being penitent, that's that's not something that is a state of being weak. It's exposing ourselves to God's phenomenal grace. And it's grace. It's what we love in the Lutheran faith when Luther really re-exposed the scriptures that there's nothing we can do by any work or action to get rid of a skeleton, to get rid of that replay in your head. It's only by grace. And then it's gone. He won't give up. Christ won't without a fight of our enemy and his enemy, Satan. He will say to Satan, I left sin with the Passover lamb. This is us talking as a Christian who takes away the sin of the world. So it's time tonight to just reframe your brains, get rid of any thoughts you have of anything you may or may not have done in the past that is haunting you and know it's a clean slate and feel the turnaround. Because Lent is about repent, and repent is not just about feeling sorry, it's doing an about face. It's turning away, and it's looking up to the Lamb, and saying, I'm turning away from my sin. Christ has, as you know, delivered us. And we look at our mark on our forehead tonight, and it should be a reminder of the marks that are present on his hands. The marks that he shows us, that he showed the Apostle Thomas along with the pierce in his sides and the marks on his feet. That he indeed has the blood-stained love for us. If you ever wondered how God reacts when shame and guilt have you cornered and are ready to swallow you up whole, if you've ever wondered how God feels when you're lost, abandoned, and helpless, if you ever wondered what would God do if he even found out about it, well, he knows, and again, he let it go. He doesn't think about it anymore. That's what baptism does. That's what being a faithful Christian does by having faith. So stand behind the words, the promises of Christ, that your sins are forgiven. Reflect no more on them. Reflect on the Lamb of God. May the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and mind focused on this beautiful Passover Lamb. Amen. Please rise for the prayer of the church.
Let us pray tonight for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Please take a moment for personal prayer. Lord, we pray tonight for all those who struggle with past sins and guilt, shame and regret that remain from those sins. Open their ears tonight to hear and believe your word that they are indeed forgiven by you. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, we pray for all those who have suffered shame, concealing the evil that has been done to them. Encourage them that, that, that even if they cannot bring themselves to reveal their pain, that you have suffered with them that you have removed their shame. Your light conquers even the deepest darkness. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, energize all pastors, educators, musicians, and leaders in your church throughout this season. Grant that their service and work proclaim faithfully your forgiveness, life, and salvation. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, bring back those who have wandered from the faith. Remind them of your grace. Help your church to be a place that welcomes others just as you welcomed others. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, restore all those who are sick, injured, recovering, are preparing for surgery. We ask your healing and patience for these, your servants. Remind them that you have walked the road of pain and suffering and will now raise them out of all their suffering when you return. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, comfort all those who are grieving the loss of loved ones, including Beth and Rod Jenkins, and Rod lost his aunt just before the service began. Uphold them all in the days of head, knowing that you too walked the road of grief, but that you are the resurrection and the life. Lord, in your mercy. O God, from whom come all holy desires, all good counsels, and all just works, give to us, your servants, that peace which the world cannot give, that our hearts may be set to obey your commandments, and that also we, being defended from the fear of our enemies, may live in peace and quietness through Jesus Christ, your Son, and our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Lord, tonight we give thee but thine own, whatever the gift may be. All that we have is thine alone, a trust, O Lord, from thee. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us, give, let, let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who overcame the assaults of the devil and gave his life as a ransom for many, that with cleansed hearts we might be prepared joyfully to celebrate the Paschal Feast in sincerity and truth. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, For you have had mercy on those who you created, and you sent your only begotten Son into our flesh to bear our sin and be our Savior. With repentant joy, we receive the salvation accomplished for us by the all-availing sacrifice of his body and his blood on the cross. Gathered in the name and in the remembrance of Jesus, we beg you, O Lord, to forgive, renew, and strengthen us with your word and your spirit. Grant us faithfully to eat his body and drink his blood, as he bids us to do in his own testament. Gather us together, we pray, from the ends of the earth to celebrate with all the faithful the marriage feast of the Lamb in his kingdom which has no end. Graciously receive our prayers, deliver and preserve us. To you alone, O Father, be glory, honor, and worship with the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever.
Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same manner also, he took the cup after supper. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. As often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Amen. O Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, in giving us your body and blood to eat and drink, you lead us to remember and confess your holy cross and passion, your blessed death, your rest in the tomb, your resurrection from the dead and your ascension into heaven, and your coming for the final judgment. So remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Please be seated.
Now may the true body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you in body and soul, in the one true faith unto life everlasting. Depart in his peace. Amen. We stand for the nunc diminis. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks that you've sent your own Son to be the Passover Lamb who takes away the sin of the world. Grant us faith, like John the Baptist, to keep our eyes upon the Lamb and to proclaim him before the world, that those not yet of your kingdom may rejoice with us in the love that has forgiven and restored us to be your people. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, and our Lord. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen.